Attorney Reddington. Thank you very much, Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor, my request is that the court not uh, enter what I would suggest is an, an inhumane order, ordering this woman to be incarcerated. We all know, as people that work in the system, that jails and prisons are woefully deficient in medical care of the most basic type. We all know that this is an individual, as Your Honor knows from Dr. Rekar's letter, who is in dire medical condition. We all know that this woman is, as counsel concedes apparently, a danger to herself. I, I, I question whether she would ever make it to a trial. She's suicidal. She's extremely emotional. However, she's unable and has been unable to express any happiness or sadness or cry. And in fact, Sometime about a month or two ago, uh, she made the comment, I just wish that I could feel something. Now our society fails miserably in treating women with postpartum depression or even postpartum psychosis. It's Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicaid. Throw the pills at you and then see how it works. If it doesn't work, increase the dose or decrease the dose then end up trying another combination of medications. We're talking a relatively short period of time from when that baby was born in October up until January, when this incident occurred, Your Honor, that she was on such significant dosage of medication. Uh, Your Honor knows that uh, Cora was born in uh, 2017. It was a very uneventful, uh, normal uh, pregnancy and delivery. No issues afterwards as far as anxiety. Dawson was born in 2018. Uh, again, it was a normal birth. Um, she had no significant issues as far as anxiety. She did have to have stitches and she was sore and that was about it. Then of course, Callan was born. When Callan was born, she ended up becoming depressed, and suffered from significant anxiety. As a result of which, she consulted with a number of doctors number of doctors indicated that she would be able to sleep, she would be able to feel, she would be able to emote uh, once these medications kicked in. And again, as I say, our medical and our society completely abandons women with this condition. It's easy to say, come on, you have a healthy baby, you have a wonderful husband, you're able to take care of your, your kids and your home, you're lucky. Take the pills, you'll be okay. Well, they put her on a number of medications. They put her on Prozac, which Your Honor is well aware, is what's known as SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Your Honor knows that along with some of these medications, they have the black box warning from the FDA, may cause suicidal ideation, may cause homicidal ideation. She was on Ativan, she was on Benadryl, and then she ended up being told, okay, because she was complaining about the effects of the Prozac, they said, stop the Prozac, we'll find something else. They put her on Remeron. Then they added on Seroquel. And Your Honor, I attached from David Benjamin, the toxicologist, some papers with the submission, and Your Honor can see the side effects that this Seroquel causes. She was having bad thoughts. She was having worsening depression. Her husband suffered through that phase. Her parents were well aware of the fact that she was suffering from this depression and depressive phase. She wasn't sleeping. She ended up, at some point, Your Honor, uh, December 31st, she was on Seroquel. They told her then uh, the Valium would be stopped. She was a shell of herself, no personality, and went to the doctor again. The doctor again prescribes the Seroquel, uh, and then they took her off the Seroquel. And then she went to the doctor, and the, at that point, they they prescribed trazodone, ativan, amitriptyline, right up to the very end, when she was so bad that she voluntarily turned herself in, if you will, to the McLean Hospital. We know that that's a psychiatric hospital. She was at the McLean Hospital for a period of about five days. While at the McLean Hospital, they basically tried to get her uh, off the Seroquel. Uh, she wanted to get off the benzodiazepines, she felt that she was being addicted to the benzodiazepines. She then ends up on trazodone, Ativan, um, 
her mood was terrible after she got out of uh, McLean Hospital. She still had the suicidal thoughts. As the government has indicated, she even told her husband that she had suicidal thoughts. You think this is something that she's planning to kill these three kids by going and getting a menu, going on to Google Maps or whatever it is, and finding out the distance? When she tells her husband she's having suicidal thoughts, probably a month prior, thoughts of hurting her children, they go to the doctor again, and she's on the medications, on and off, on and off. This is a significant issue between the postpartum depression as well as possibility of postpartum psychosis that is pretty much ignored. But nevertheless, with the overlay of the SSRIs and the history, and Your Honor has some uh, emails and things that people would reach out to me from all over the world indicating that their daughter had the same problem, that they had the same problem. Your Honor is well aware that many times when people are on Prozac or on SSRIs, Workplace violence, homicides, family homicides. This is clearly a tragic, which is a word that's used too much in the criminal justice system, but this really is a tragedy, this case. So we have, obviously, I would suggest, a very good defense for this young woman. She's 32 years of age, Your Honor. She met her husband. He was the love of her life. They got married wonderful young couple, and as counsel noted, she always wanted to have kids, always wanted to have babies. She's a nurse. She went to be a midwife because she wanted to help other women that would be in having babies, but didn't want to have all the medications. She was not a big medication person. Your Honor saw, I think there's probably close to 50 letters that have been submitted to you, and I know you read every one of them, the incredible outpouring of support by other nurses that work at Mass General Hospital. The fact that these women have a vigil, that they, that they write the letters to this court imploring you to understand that you sentence, far as bail issue, the woman before you, who was a beautiful person who was thoroughly destroyed by these medications. That's for another day, obviously. A bail issue, bail argument, your Honor is well aware under Commonwealth versus Vasquez at 481 Mass 750, Supreme Judicial Court indicated that this court, or the court, has vested in sound discretion of the bail judge. And the main considerations would be obviously the usual bail considerations, nature and circumstance of the offense, likelihood of success on the defense, roots in the community, and of course, as the in, in Vasquez case, as well as Commonwealth versus Herring, 489 Mass 569, defendant's risk of flight. So now you have a situation, Your Honor, where this woman has incredible support, as you saw. Letters from Foxborough that were signed by about 15 women. Letters from her family, friends. Letters from she, people she's known since the sixth grade uh, that have stayed in touch with her. One thing that's a theme that is readily apparent is that Lindsay loved her children that she would always, one of the letters said, she would always rub her belly, rub her belly. She had pictures of her pregnant standing next to Patrick, hanging on the wall. I was in the house. The house is absolutely loaded with indicia of love for those kids. Photographs on the wall, little drawings, um, all sorts of games, toys, play pens, bassinets in the living room, in the dining room, the kitchen loaded with toys virtually the entire house, including their master bedroom. Toys, things for the kids. This is not a situation, Your Honor, that was planned by any mean. This is a situation that clearly was a product of mental illness. Now, under the Vasquez case, one of the issues, as I said, is <clears throat> whether or not there's a risk of flight. Now, I did submit to Your Honor a letter that was written by her physician, her attending surgeon, uh, Nakul Reka. And this doctor was in surgery until 8.30 at night and actually took the time to write this letter for you to review. And I just want to make note that he makes reference to the fact that she is now in her 12th day of hospitalization following admission on January 25 after a 20-foot fall. She suffered, unlike when the government Friday was saying that she can move her legs and she's getting better, she's okay. No, she's not okay at all. He indicates that she suffered several severe 
spine fractures, including spinal cord transection. You know what that means. At the level of T5, T6, as you know, she had surgery for this from the Orthopedic Spine Surgical Service who performed a decompression infusion. Unfortunately, she is not expected to recover meaningful function at this point below that level of the spinal cord, which makes her a paraplegic, unable to move her legs or feel sensation from below her, he refers to umbilicus or belly button. He says she has no function below this level. Additionally, less active issues include rib fractures in the chest, both sides, cervical spine fractures, necessitate the wearing of a collar around her neck due to the cervical spine fractures. She's paralyzed. The doctor indicates that she needs significant medical treatment. Doctor recommends that she would be discharged to Spalding Rehab. Now you know that we have Spalding Rehab, you know that we have the Worcester Hospital. Um, this court is vested under Vasquez with your authority. To have this woman not held on bail, perhaps put a GPS on her, I guess, if someone's concerned that she's going to miraculously recover, which isn't going to happen. As your honor knows, being a paraplegic, paralyzed, she can't move, can't get off the bed, she can't walk, she can't even go to the bathroom. She has to have 24-7 medical care. Her emotional state is so bad that there is a significant fear of suicide. She has to have someone sit in the room 24-7 to watch her. They don't talk to her. They're not you know, chatting it up. They just sit there and watch out of that concern that she would commit suicide. So you have a paraplegic who can't walk, who is definitely a danger to herself, and the government wants to put her in where? Framingham State Prison? Plymouth House of Correction? There's no way that any humane person would do that, especially within the structure of our criminal justice system, where a person is presumed innocent. And I'm not suggesting with the facts that the government has read, but she has a good defense. She's got a darn good defense to this case, because that's what happened. And I just want to share with you, Your Honor, one of the things that's interesting. When I was in the House, um, I came across a, a drawer that had a bunch of pill bottles in it. And I called the DA and I said, I got these pill bottles. And we made arrangements, I'm going to be giving them to them. Um, and it's all the Prozac and the Trazodone and all that stuff. But inside the drawer was this little vase. And uh, I didn't know what it was. It just looked like a little vase to me. And my wife said to me, oh, that looks like a, uh, a wish vase. I said, what's a wish, wish vase? She said, when people write down little wishes and they put little pieces of paper and they put them inside the vase. And there are literally dozens of these little pieces of paper that talk about Lindsay's wish for happiness and health for her children, that she could get pregnant again, that she would be able to be with her children, little Callan, Dawson, Cora, that they would be happy, healthy, and successful. This is not a woman, Your Honor, that had any reason to harm those innocent children. My request, Your Honor, is that the court would put her on a GPS if you feel that's required and let the doctors continue to treat her, let her go to Spalding Rehab. She will sign a waiver that allows probation at any time to speak with her treating physicians uh, or social worker, find out how she's doing. Does it look as though she's getting close to regaining the ability to walk, which she isn't, but nevertheless, they would be able to do that. And then the government would be notified and they can come back in here again and try to hold her without bail. And my request would then be to Worcester for the emotional and the uh, mental illness aspect. I don't think that it's fair or just or consistent with our duties to each other as human beings to put her in jail. I'm asking that she be allowed to continue with her medical treatment. Your Honor.